He's alive. He's not a stranger to us. He's alive. One of my favorite songs ever talks about Peter singing that very words. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are opened wide. He's alive. Wow. I remember that very clearly. I was in high school when I heard that. So that means it's about 45 years old. Not nah, probably not that old. But he's alive is where we are. If he's not alive, we're not here. If he's not alive, we're still dead in our sin. If he's not alive, you have no hope. But because he is, you are free to live like you ought to live. Free to be the people God's called you to be. Free to be people who love deeply, as we'll read now. Starting in the first verse there in chapter 20. Early on on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started towards the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have yet to return to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. You know the resurrection is in all four of the Gospels. And the resurrection is the pivot point of all history. Everything comes from this point here. I don't know what it was like. Earlier this morning, I I talked about two earthquakes, one on the day Jesus was crucified, and the second one on this morning when we read in chapter chapter 22 in Matthew. Two earthquakes close together. Some would say that's just a normal thing. One is a, a shock and the other is an aftershock. But both of them rolled graves open. Both of them let the dead out. And and I've thought about this a lot. What was it like to be Mary Magdalene walking to the tomb? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because there's probably just a few of you, but I was out this morning at at 3.30 because I was too excited. I got out and I walked around and I looked to see what was happening, and the moon was so big. I wanted to wake people up, but that wasn't a good idea. But I think that's what it was like for Mary. The moon would have been the same way it is for us now. The first full moon after spring. And that's when Passover takes place. And that's when everything is lit up. But it says here that she was out while it was still dark. I don't know that everybody likes the dark. You can trip in the dark. You can fall down in the dark. You can get lost in the dark. In the book of John, it says that people love the darkness. They don't like the light. But when the light has come, we rejoice. And that's what she was doing. She was walking in the dark. And she saw that the stone had been removed. So what did she do? Did she go home? 
Did she think about what she was supposed to do next? She went and told Simon Peter and the other disciple, which I believe is John. And she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. I think there was fear. I think there was fear in Mary and I think there was frustration. And I think there was something that gripped her at the heart level. You know, I think we understand things intellectually, but I don't know we always grab things with our heart. Because I know that there are times when I've seen people walk in the dark and I've seen people fall down and I've seen people get hurt and I've been one of them. And it's hard. You need people around you to lift you back up. You need people to act like Jesus. The resurrected Jesus solves all our problems. He takes care of our hearts. He makes us one with God. He brings us home. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. And the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. So Tanner, I think I'm on the third slide. There it is. That is a picture of Peter and John running. <clears throat> this may be one of my favorite pictures in the world. I have pictures in my office. I have, that's how I view counseling every time. On the one, one side right across from me is the prodigal son by Rembrandt. I love that picture. And in the middle is Peace Be Still where Jesus is calming the waters. I love that picture. And this picture, the first time I saw it, you, you had let me go on a sabbatical. And I was in France. And I was in church in uh, a French Baptist church was really nice. And they had a really great meal, and they invited me in, and I, I got to stay. And they said, before you leave, you need to go to Muse d'Orsay. Seat. And I said, sure. I walked around for a while, and there's really pretty things there. There's Monet's, and there's statues, and there's things. But I sat down in front of this picture. They ran. And... When I sat in front of that picture, I know I looked crazy because I cried. And I thought to myself, running to Jesus is the very best thing you can do. You know, I'd been in church that morning, and I had heard a nice sermon in French, which I understood about two words of. And they fed me really well, and they tried to take care of me. But it was the Holy Spirit that took care of me because he healed my heart, kind of like he did here with John and Simon Peter. Their hearts were on fire. And you know what that's like. You know exactly what it's like. When you become a Christian, when you, when you hold on and God starts answering your prayers and, and things have changed in your life, you just go, it is the awe of knowing God. You know, that word is that way on purpose. It's a, it's a word that means the sound of. So when you say, oh, that's the word you're looking for. And that is what I believe they said when they got inside and they found that the cloth was neatly folded in the corner by itself and separate from the linen. I believe Jesus exploded out of that tomb. I believe he went right through everything because he is our risen Lord. He knows no boundaries. He's the creator of the universe and he loves you. Uh, that strikes me. We talked about baptism this morning and how we identify with, with Jesus, and, and that's such a big thing because we get to know people as you, you, you talk and you, you become a family and you, you grow close together and you get knit in the heart. And you need Jesus. See, I, I read this over and over and over again, and it said, he saw and believed, and yet the next verse is in parentheses. They still do not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, but they believed. What do you believe when you don't understand the scripture? How do you live when you don't understand? Somebody has to come on side and say, oh, this is what this means, and in the Greek it says this, but in the Hebrew it says that. Excuse me. 
when you know and you believe, even though you don't understand, even though you don't know why, even though it doesn't make any sense because how could someone rise from the dead? And you believe anyway. That's faith. And that faith is given to you as a gift. And that faith is inside of you when you receive Christ. And that faith moves your heart to do good things, not to do bad things anymore, but to do good things. And that faith draws you to other people who are like-minded and who have the same heart, who want to be careful with each other. And even though they didn't understand, they believed. Now, I'm going to go on here. And then verse 10, it says, the disciples went back to their homes, period. Wow. They just went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. And they asked, woman, why are you crying? I always thought that was rude. Why did they say that? Woman. They didn't say young lady. They didn't say, hey, you. They said, woman. And uh, they were getting her attention. Why are you crying? She was crying because all of her hopes and dreams had been tied into this one guy. And he died. And then somebody stole him. She was crumpling inside. And I think that happens to us sometimes. We crumple inside. We have heard that Jesus was going to rise from the dead from all of the scriptures up to this point. We have heard that Jesus is the living word. But sometimes you just don't understand. And sometimes you need this. She said, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. And I think this happens frequently. I think Jesus comes to us and we don't recognize him because we don't know how it feels to be loved. And when he loves, he's very blunt. He says, woman, again, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. I think she was willing to pay any price to get that body back, anything she had. And Jesus said to her, Mary, I have often wanted to put my own name there. When I'm hurting, because pastors hurt too, when I have need, I need to have Jesus call my name. There's something I learned this week. I read it a three, four, five times, but it came from Max Lucado, and I read it, and it said, the God of the universe has your picture on his refrigerator. You know who's on your refrigerator. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, knows you by name. The Bible says he's inscribed our names on his hands. He knows you by name. And so when he calls you by name, you can trust that because that's what faith is. Faith is trusting completely, wholly, fully. Faith is loyalty to God in spite of the things we don't understand. She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, don't hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead and tell them I am returning to the Father. And your father. See, it's my father and your father. That makes it personal. To my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. I don't think she hit the ground once. I think she floated on air. I think she ran so fast. Because she had to say to everybody she knew, He is risen. He's alive. No longer do we have to worry. I've seen the Lord. And she told him, that she had, he had said these things to her. So we have a big picture today. We have a picture of a God who loves us so much that he would die for us. That's why the cross is there, to remind us. But you've got to know that the cross is empty because he didn't stay there. The cross is empty because he didn't stay dead. He's alive. That makes you alive. So we did baptisms. We talked about life being buried with Christ and rising with Christ. Now we're going to go to communion. And we're going to talk about what it means to break bread with our Savior. 
to understand the life that he gives to each of us. So I'm going to come down and you can pray and it'll be good. So I'd like you to pray individually, get your heart right so you know exactly what's going on. And if you're a believer, please take communion. If you're not yet a believer, talk to me about it. I was whispering voice because I learned that as a teacher. If you whisper, things do better. Don't yell. If you don't know Jesus yet, come to me in quiet. And I'll tell you. So, men, if you'd come.